As we embark on the second chapter of our journey into the back end of the line, BEOL, interconnects, we anticipate a voyage as enlightening as it is thrilling. Today, our compass points towards the intricate cosmos of semiconductor devices, with a spotlight on the application of thin film technology and bail interconnects. I'm Semi Sherpa, your trusted guide through this intricate maze of semiconductor processes. Deciphering the complexities of bail interconnects is a pivotal aspect of semiconductor manufacturing knowledge. Unraveling its intricacies can be akin to unlocking a Pandora's box of innovation and understanding. This exploration is tailored to cater to a wide audience, whether you're a seasoned engineer, a curious student, or a professional venturing into the semiconductor landscape. In our inaugural episode, we navigated the rich tapestry of Interconnect's history, delved into the artistry of aluminum metallization, unraveled the science underpinning tungsten via, and marveled at the wizardry of silicide technology. In this episode, we'll plunge deeper, unearthing the enigmas of electroplating technology, marveling at the wonders of copper interconnects, and investigating alternative copper technologies. So, secure your seatbelts and prepare for a journey that promises to be as enlightening as it is exhilarating. Are you ready to plunge into the fascinating world of interconnects? Let's ignite our intellectual engines and embark on this adventure together. In the realm of semiconductor devices, back end of line, BEOL, interconnects play a crucial role in the overall performance of the chip. These interconnects, essentially the wiring schemes within the chip, are becoming increasingly compact with each technology node. This miniaturization, while beneficial for the overall chip size, leads to an undesired increase in the resistance capacitance, RC, delay and chips. RC delay is a fundamental concept in electronics, representing the delay and signal speed through a physical gate or wire. It is a product of the resistance and capacitance of the circuit or interconnect, and it is a key factor in determining the speed and performance of a chip. As the dimensions of the interconnects shrink, the cross-sectional area of the wires reduces, leading to an increase in the resistance. Simultaneously, the closer proximity of the wires leads to an increase in capacitance. Both these factors contribute to an increase in the RC product, which in turn leads to an increase in signal delay. The time constant, represented by the Greek letter tau, is a measure of the system's response time and is equal to the RC product. It is the time required for the system to charge or discharge to approximately 63.2% of its full response. In the context of an RC circuit, the time constant is the time it takes for the voltage across the capacitor to reach approximately 63.2% of its final voltage when charged from an initial voltage of zero. This time constant is a key index in quantifying the RC delay in a system. In practical applications, when a pulse is applied multiple times to an RC circuit, the waveform of the output signal changes due to the RC delay. If the pulse frequency is high, the capacitor does not get enough time to fully charge or discharge, leading to a distortion of the output signal. This is particularly evident when a square wave is applied to an RC circuit. The output signal, instead of being a perfect square wave, appears as a wave with rounded edges and exponential rises and falls. This distortion is a direct consequence of the RC delay. In conclusion, the RC delay in bail interconnects is a critical factor that influences the performance of semiconductor devices. As technology continues to advance and the demand for smaller, faster chips increases, addressing the challenges posed by RC delay will continue to be a key focus in the design and manufacture of semiconductor devices. In the world of semiconductor devices, the back end of line, BEOL, interconnects play a pivotal role in the overall performance of the system. As technology advances and devices continue to scale down, the RC delay, which is a product of the resistance, R, and capacitance, C, of the interconnects, becomes a significant factor in the overall system performance. The RC delay is composed of two main components, the gate delay and the bail interconnect delay. The gate delay, which is the delay caused by the transistor, has been decreasing with scaling. This is because as the transistor size reduces, the channel length decreases. The channel length is the distance between the source and the drain in a transistor, and the shorter this distance, the less time it takes for electrons to travel from the source to the drain, thus leading to faster switching times and shorter gate delays. On the other hand, the bail interconnect delay has been increasing with scaling. This is due to the fact that as devices scale down, the interconnects become narrower and longer, leading to an increase in resistance. 
Additionally, the closer spacing between interconnects leads to an increase in capacitance due to the stronger electric field between the lines. Around the 250 nanometers technology generation, the bail delay started to become more significant than the gate delay. This shift in the dominant factor of delay has led to a change in focus towards reducing the bail delay. One of the strategies employed to reduce the bail delay is the use of new materials. For instance, copper, Cu, has replaced aluminum, Al, in interconnects due to its lower resistivity, reducing the resistance of the interconnects. Similarly, low-K dielectric materials have replaced silicon dioxide, SiO2, as the interlayer dielectric material to reduce the capacitance between interconnects. The importance of managing RC delay in bail interconnects is further emphasized by the impact it has on system performance. The delay can affect the timing of signals, leading to issues such as clock skew, where the arrival times of the clock signal to all registers in a synchronous digital system vary. This can lead to timing issues and potential errors in the system operation. As semiconductor technology continues to scale down, the back end of line, VEOL, interconnect system faces significant challenges, particularly in terms of increased RC delay. This delay, which is the product of the resistance, R, and capacitance, C, in the interconnect system, has a direct impact on the overall performance of the semiconductor device. To mitigate this, a multilayer scheme is employed in the bail interconnect system. The multilayer scheme in bail interconnects consists of three main types of interconnects, global, intermediate, and local. Each type of interconnect has a specific role and is designed to optimize the overall performance of the system. The global interconnects are used for long-distance connections, while the intermediate and local interconnects are used for shorter distances. As the technology scales, the number of metal layers in the bail interconnect system is increased. This is done to manage the RC delay and ensure that the performance of the semiconductor device is not compromised. The addition of more metal layers allows for more efficient routing of signals, thereby reducing the RC delay. An analogy can be drawn to illustrate the function of the multilayer scheme in Bale Interconnects. Consider the journey from San Francisco to Los Angeles. If one were to travel only via local roads, the journey would be long and time-consuming. However, if the journey is broken down into segments of local roads, highways, and then local roads again, the travel time is significantly reduced. Similarly, in the Bale Interconnect system, signals are routed through local, global, and then local interconnects again, optimizing the speed and efficiency of signal transmission. Multi-layering in the bail process refers to the creation of multiple layers of metal interconnects separated by dielectric layers. Each metal layer is interconnected through vias and trenches etched into the dielectric. The metal layers are often referred to by their pitch size, which is the distance between identical features in an array. The pitch sizes can be categorized as 1x, 2x, 4x, 8x, and so on, with each subsequent category representing a doubling of the pitch size. The term bail option refers to the specific configuration of these metal layers in a given semiconductor device. For instance, a bail option of 3402 would mean that there are three layers of 1x pitch, four layers of 2x pitch, no layers of 4x pitch, and two layers of 8x pitch. The final layer is typically made of aluminum. The choice of bail option depends on the specific requirements of the device being designed. For example, a more complex device like a high-performance microprocessor might require more metal layers, and thus a higher bail option, than a simpler device like a memory chip. The bail process and the choice of bail option have significant implications for the performance, power consumption, and cost of the final semiconductor device. For example, using more metal layers can increase the device's performance and complexity, but it can also increase the device's power consumption and manufacturing cost. The choice of bail options depends on the specific requirements of the device being manufactured. Different devices may require different interconnect configurations, depending on factors such as power, performance, area, and cost, PPAC. In the context of a foundry, the bail options are often determined by the IP, intellectual property, design requirements. The foundry would provide a variety of bail options, and the IP designer would select the most appropriate option based on the specific requirements of the design. In conclusion, the bail process and the concept of multi-layering are essential aspects of modern semiconductor manufacturing. They enable the creation of complex, 
high-performance devices, but they also present significant challenges in terms of power consumption, cost, and manufacturing complexity. The back end of line, the EOL, process in semiconductor manufacturing is a critical phase where the individual devices on a chip are interconnected using metal wires. These wires are insulated by dielectric layers, and the choice of dielectric material can significantly impact the overall performance of the chip. In the early days of semiconductor manufacturing, silicon dioxide, SiO2, was the standard dielectric material used in the bale process. However, as the industry moved towards smaller device geometries, the limitations of SiO2 became apparent. The RC delay, a product of resistance, R, and capacitance, C, became a significant concern. This was particularly noticeable at the 250 nanometers technology node, where the delay caused by the bail interconnect exceeded the gate delay. A notable milestone in the evolution of bail interconnects was the introduction of the IBM 7S microprocessor in 1997. This was the first chip to use copper metallization, with one tungsten contact and seven copper layers. However, it still used SiO2 as the dielectric material, marking the point where the industry began to recognize the need for lower K materials. The term low K refers to a material's low dielectric constant, which results in lower capacitance and, consequently, a reduction in RC delay. The first significant step in this direction was the introduction of fluorinated silicon dioxide, FSIO2. The fluorine atoms in FSIO2 reduced the material's dielectric constant, thereby reducing the RC delay. This is because fluorine atoms have a lower polarizability than oxygen atoms, which reduces the overall polarizability of the material and hence its dielectric constant. However, FSIO2 had its own set of challenges, particularly in terms of mechanical strength and thermal stability. The next major development was the introduction of organosilicate glass, OSG, materials, also known as carbon-doped oxides, CDO, or SICOH. By incorporating carbon into the SiO2 matrix, the dielectric constant was further reduced. The carbon-carbon and carbon-fluorine bonds in these materials have lower polarizability than the silicon-oxygen bonds in SiO2, which leads to a lower dielectric constant. However, the addition of carbon also led to increased leakage currents and reduced reliability. The industry continued to innovate, and porous low-K materials were introduced. The introduction of porosity into the dielectric material further reduced the K-value. This is because the pores are filled with air or vacuum, both of which have a lower dielectric constant than solid materials. However, these materials presented their own challenges, including increased susceptibility to moisture absorption and mechanical fragility. In the ongoing quest to reduce RC delay, the industry has continued to innovate and develop new strategies. One such strategy is the introduction of air gap structures. Air gaps have a dielectric constant close to 1, which is the lowest possible value, thereby significantly reducing the RC delay. However, the implementation of air gaps presents its own set of challenges, including the complexity of integration into the manufacturing process and the potential for increased mechanical fragility. In the realm of back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, the choice of material plays a pivotal role in the overall performance and reliability of the device. Two commonly used materials are aluminum, AL, and copper, CU, each with its own set of advantages and disadvantages. Aluminum, for instance, is a cost-effective option that boasts a high electrical conductivity even in thin film states, closely resembling its bulk state. This makes it an attractive choice for manufacturers. The ease of film deposition and its excellent adhesion to oxide layers further enhance its appeal. Moreover, compared to copper, aluminum is easier to handle in photo-slash-etch processes and has the ability to reduce natural oxide layers. However, aluminum is not without its drawbacks. It is prone to junction spiking and electromigration, both of which can negatively impact device performance. The formation of helix, corrosion, and a lower melting point compared to copper are additional challenges associated with aluminum. On the other hand, copper offers lower resistance than aluminum, which can lead to improved device performance. It also has a higher melting point and lower diffusivity, which can enhance device reliability by suppressing electromigration. Yet, copper also presents its own set of challenges. Dry etching of copper is difficult, necessitating the use of the damascene process. Copper also diffuses quickly in silicon and dielectrics, requiring encapsulation with a diffusion barrier such as TAN, SIN, 
or CO. This necessitates dedicated equipment and part cleaning. Copper's poor adhesion to SiO2 often requires a glue layer or surface treatment. Furthermore, copper exhibits a wide variation in electromigration and stress migration resistance, necessitating interface control. In modern devices, the final wiring that connects to the solder bump is often formed with aluminum. This is due to a combination of factors including cost-effectiveness, ease of processing, and the ability to reduce natural oxide layers. In the context of back-end-of-line, BEOL, interconnects, the electroplating copper process is a critical step in the damascene process, which is a method of interconnect fabrication. This process begins with the deposition of a barrier layer, typically tantalum nitride, TN, followed by a wetting layer, often tantalum, TA. These layers are deposited using physical vapor deposition, PVD. The barrier layer prevents copper diffusion into the dielectric, while the wetting layer promotes good adhesion between the copper and the barrier layer. Following the deposition of these layers, a thin copper seed layer is deposited, also using PVD. This seed layer serves as a base for the subsequent electroplating process. The electroplating of copper, often referred to as electrochemical deposition, ECD, or electroplating, EP, is then carried out. This process involves the use of an electric current to reduce dissolved metal cations, enabling them to deposit as a pure metal onto a substrate. In this case, the substrate is the copper seed layer. The electroplating process allows for a bottom-up fill of the features etched into the dielectric layer, ensuring a void-free fill. After the electroplating process, the excess copper and barrier layer materials are removed using a process known as chemical mechanical polishing, CMP. This planarizes the wafer surface for the next level of interconnects. In summary, the electroplating copper process in bale interconnects involves a series of steps, the deposition of a barrier layer and a wetting layer, the deposition of a copper seed layer, the electroplating of copper, and finally, the planarization of the wafer surface using CMP. The electroplating reactor, or cell, is a crucial component in the electroplating process. It consists of a cathode and an anode. In the context of bale interconnects, the wafer, which is in electrical contact with the cathode, acts as the cathode itself. The copper seed layer on the wafer plays a significant role in the copper electroplating process. The electrolyte used in the process is typically composed of CuSO4, H2SO4, and HCl. CuSO4 acts as the copper ion source, H2SO4 controls the batch conductivity and helps in the removal of native copper oxide, since the process occurs at a pH less than 3, and HCl enhances the adsorption of the suppressor, forming a CuClPeg bond. Additives are also introduced to facilitate the bottom-up fill. These include an accelerator, SPS, a suppressor, PEG, and a leveler, a large molecule polymer. In terms of the electrochemical reactions at the cathode, wafer seed copper, reduction occurs where copper 2 plus ions gain electrons to form copper solid with a standard electrode potential, E0, of minus 0.337 volts. At the anode, soluble copper, oxidation occurs where copper solid loses electrons to form copper 2 plus ions, with E0 of plus 0.337 volts. In the back end of line, the EOL, interconnect process, electroplating of copper, Cu, is a critical step. The electroplating process involves the deposition of copper into the trenches and vias etched into the dielectric layer. This process is facilitated by a solution containing copper ions and a variety of additives, which play a crucial role in the successful deposition of copper. The additives in the electroplating bath typically include accelerators, suppressors, and levelers. Each of these additives has a unique function that contributes to the overall effectiveness and efficiency of the copper electroplating process. Accelerators, also known as brighteners, enhance the plating rate on the copper surface. They are organic compounds that are adsorbed onto the copper surface, increasing the local current density and thus accelerating the deposition rate. The bond strength between the copper and the accelerator is stronger than that between the copper and the suppressor, which ensures a rapid and uniform deposition of copper. Suppressors, on the other hand, are film-forming agents that slow down the plating rate. They form a protective film on the copper surface, which suppresses the deposition of copper. This is particularly important in the initial stages of the electroplating process, where the suppressor helps to prevent voids and seams in the copper layer by ensuring a slow and controlled deposition rate. Levelers are additives that help to create a smooth and level copper surface. They preferentially adsorb onto the high current density areas, thereby reducing the plating rate in these areas and promoting a more uniform deposition across the entire copper surface. In addition to these additives, chloride ions are also present in the electroplating bath. They act as a complexing agent, helping to stabilize the copper ions in the solution and enhance the overall plating process. 
without any additives, the electroplating process would result in a void-filled copper layer due to the uncontrolled deposition of copper. With the suppressor only, seams would form in the copper layer due to the lack of control over the deposition rate. Therefore, the combination of accelerators, suppressors, and levelers, along with chloride ions, is crucial for achieving a smooth, uniform, and void-free copper layer in the bale interconnect process. The electroplating process is a critical step in the formation of back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, particularly in the deposition of copper, CU. However, achieving uniform deposition across the wafer, especially from the center to the edge, can be challenging due to the inherent properties of the materials and the electroplating process itself. The electroplating apparatus typically consists of a copper anode of 99.99% purity, a cathode which is the wafer itself, and a membrane that acts as a potential barrier allowing only copper cations to pass through while blocking the entry of additives. This setup is housed within a novellus equipment, which also includes a separate anode cell, SAC. In the absence of any special measures, a phenomenon known as edge-fast growth occurs. This is due to the high resistance to ionic current at the center of the wafer and low resistance at the edges, resulting in a low current density at the center and high at the edges. This uneven current density leads to a thicker metal deposition at the edges of the wafer, creating a non-uniform deposition profile. As devices continue to scale down and line widths narrow, the seed layer thickness decreases. This reduction in seed layer thickness exacerbates the non-uniformity issue as it increases the resistance of the seed layer, leading to even worse dispersion. To address these challenges, auxiliary measures such as high-resistance virtual anode, HRVA, auxiliary electrodes, and E-iris are employed to make the electric field more uniform. The HRVA, for instance, is an ionically resistive element with electrolyte permeable pores or holes, positioned in close proximity to the wafer substrate. It significantly improves plating uniformity on thin resistive seed layers and is particularly effective when used in conjunction with an auxiliary cathode that diverts or removes a portion of the current from the anode that would otherwise pass to the edge region of the wafer. In summary, the combination of these techniques and apparatus effectively redistributes the ionic current in the plating system, allowing for the plating of uniform metal layers and mitigating the terminal effect, thereby improving the center edge deposition rate uniformity in copper electroplating for bale interconnect. Copper electroplating is a critical process in the fabrication of semiconductor devices, particularly in the formation of interconnects in the back end of line, BEOL, process. One of the challenges in this process is the difference in current density between the center and the edge of the wafer, which can lead to non-uniform deposition of copper and subsequently, variations in the thickness of the copper layer across the wafer. The root cause of this issue lies in the inherent resistive nature of the seed layer used in the electroplating process. The seed layer, typically a thin layer of copper, presents a higher resistance to current flow compared to the anode, which is made of bulk copper. According to Faraday's law of electrolysis, the rate of deposition of copper is directly proportional to the current. Therefore, the higher resistance of the seed layer results in a lower current at the center of the wafer compared to the edge, leading to a thinner deposition of copper at the center. One approach to mitigate this issue is to reduce the supply voltage during the initial growth step of the electroplating process. This can help to minimize the current difference between the center and the edge of the wafer. However, this method may lead to a decrease in throughput, thus affecting the overall productivity of the process. Another method to address this issue is to increase the thickness of the seed layer. However, as device dimensions continue to shrink due to scaling, this method becomes increasingly challenging to implement due to the narrowing of the wiring line width. A more effective approach to reducing the center edge current difference is to use a high-resistance virtual anode, HRVA. The HRVA creates multiple virtual anodes closer to the cathode, effectively reducing the distance between the cathode and anode. This results in an improvement in the uniformity of the electric field, which in turn leads to a more uniform current distribution across the wafer. This approach provides a way to control the uniformity of the current, independent of the resistances of the cathode and the electrolyte, thereby reducing the center edge current difference. Copper has been recognized as a superior interconnect material due to its low electrical resistivity and excellent electromigration resistance. The interconnect copper is realized by electroplating, a process that consists of three steps, copper plating, edge bevel removal, EBR, and copper anneal. The EBR process is crucial as it uses a mixture of sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide to remove the edge and backside metal layer. This process is particularly important since 55 nanometers tech node, where the EBR width in the top metal layer electroplating is key to chip manufacturing. A wider EBR can affect the yield of chips located at the wafer edge and can also lead to wafer ID miss auto-read issues. 
In the context of Novellus equipment, the post-electrophil module, PEM, is used to perform the EBR process after electroplating. The PEM plays a crucial role in the wafer edge rinse, EBR, process. This is necessary because the bevel area is not effectively removed during the copper CMP process. The bevel area, in particular, lacks a barrier, making it susceptible to coup peel-off. Typically, a mixture of sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide is used to dissolve about 1.8 mm of the bevel area. Generally, the EBR process consists of two steps of acid cleaning. The effectiveness of this process is determined by several parameters, including the etchant volume, etchant flow rate, and wafer rotating speed in both steps. This detailed process ensures the effective removal of copper from the wafer bevel and backside, contributing to the overall efficiency and reliability of the chip manufacturing process. In the context of copper electroplating in bale interconnect processes, the Chemical Monitoring System, CMS, plays a crucial role in maintaining the quality and efficiency of the process. The CMS is responsible for the accurate and prompt concentration monitoring and control of the multi-component electroplating baths, which are indispensable in satisfying process specifications for the manufacturing of electronic components while minimizing production costs. The CMS utilizes techniques such as cyclic voltammetric stripping, CVS, and photometry to monitor the concentrations of various constituents in the plating bath. CVS is used to determine the concentration of organic additives such as suppressors, brighteners, and levelers. These additives exert an effect on the electrodeposition rate at a given potential. The potential of a rotating platinum electrode is cycled at a constant sweep rate in a bath sample, depositing a small amount of metal on the electrode and then stripping it off by anodic dissolution. The charge required to strip the metal is related to the additive concentration using predetermined calibration curves. This electrochemical approach, coupled with titrations of certain bath components or other suppressors and accelerators, allows for a reasonable correlation to be made to the additives in the electroplating bath. Automated equipment has been developed to perform this analysis, making CVS a common method due to its relative simplicity. Photometric analysis techniques are used to monitor the concentration of copper sulfate. These techniques are fast, simple, and relatively cheap. They can be easily automated, potentially without involving extraction of a bath sample. A light source and absorbance detector can be placed remotely from the analysis cell via a bundle of flexible glass or plastic pipe fibers. The optimum wavelength of light to be used for a given species is determined from a spectrographic scan over a wide range of wavelengths. A wavelength at or near a strong absorption peak is selected and a calibration curve based on Beer's law is prepared. The unknown can then be measured and its absorbance compared to the calibration curve to determine the concentration of the constituent of interest. UV slash visible photometric analysis works well for the transition metals. For example, copper 2 plus iron in electroless plating baths is determined at 620 nanometers wavelength. For chloride, Cl, its concentration is analyzed through direct potentiometric titration, DPT. The titrant silver nitrate reacts with chloride anion to form silver chloride precipitate, and by analyzing the potential during this electrochemical reaction, the concentration of chlorine ion can be determined. In addition to these techniques, the CMS may also employ more advanced systems such as the Real-Time Analyzer, RTA, which utilizes DC and AC voltammetric techniques to provide a complete chemical analysis of different electrochemical deposition solutions. The RTA employs multivariate calibration when predicting concentration parameters from a multivariate data set. This system requires no specially trained chemical operators and practically eliminates the need for a chemical analytical laboratory. In conclusion, the CMS in copper electroplating is a sophisticated system that employs a variety of techniques to ensure the quality and efficiency of the electroplating process. It is an integral part of the bale interconnect process, ensuring that the strict requirements of chip manufacturing are met. The annealing process in the context of bale, back end of line, interconnects, specifically for electroplated copper, CU, is a critical step in semiconductor manufacturing. This process is designed to enhance the performance of the copper interconnects, which are key components in modern integrated circuits. After the electroplating process, the copper interconnects undergo an annealing process. The annealing process involves heating the material, in this case, copper, to a specific temperature and then allowing it to cool slowly. This process is used to increase the size of the grains in the copper, thereby reducing the resistance of the material. In the case of copper interconnects, the annealing process is typically carried out at 200 degrees Celsius for one hour in a rapid thermal annealing process with nitrogen, N2. This process is known as RTN, rapid thermal annealing with nitrogen. The annealing process is crucial for the performance of the copper interconnects. 
it helps to reduce the resistance of the copper, which is important for the efficient operation of the integrated circuits. The reduction in resistance is achieved through the growth of copper grains during the annealing process. As the grain size increases, the number of grain boundaries, which are areas of high resistance, decreases. This results in a decrease in the overall resistance of the copper interconnects. However, the annealing process must be carefully controlled to prevent the formation of voids in the copper interconnects. Voids can form due to the presence of impurities such as oxygen in the copper films. These voids can negatively impact the performance of the copper interconnects by increasing their resistance and reducing their reliability. Therefore, the annealing process must be carefully optimized to maximize the benefits of grain growth while minimizing the risk of void formation. In addition to the annealing process, other factors can also influence the performance of the copper interconnects. For example, the quality of the electroplating process can have a significant impact on the performance of the copper interconnects. The electroplating process must be carefully controlled to ensure that the copper is deposited evenly and without defects. This can help to ensure that the copper interconnects have the desired electrical properties and can perform effectively in the integrated circuits. In conclusion, the annealing process is a critical step in the manufacturing of copper interconnects in semiconductor devices. It helps to enhance the performance of the copper interconnects by reducing their resistance and improving their reliability. However, the process must be carefully controlled to prevent the formation of voids and to ensure the optimal performance of the copper interconnects. The electroplating of copper in the bale interconnect process is followed by a chemical mechanical polishing, CMP, process. However, a unique defect known as copper dendrite growth can occur after the CMP process. This defect is not only unique to copper but also observed in several metals such as gold, silver, and tin. The formation of dendrites is an electrochemical process that occurs in the presence of moisture, ionic contamination, and a potential difference between metals. In the microelectronic device, the wet chemical surface creates a galvanic cell where copper lines on the P-plus region behave as an anode and copper lines on the N-plus region behave as a cathode. In critical or reproducible conditions such as the presence of light, temperature, or non-respect of design rules, dendrites can be generated. The copper dendrite growth is due to the brush wobbling of the CMP machine, which results in moisture or wet chemical remaining at the wafer center during the post-CMP cleaning process. The presence of complexing or chelating agents in the slurry would have provided the ionic contamination needed. The subsequent dissolution of the copper line and formation of copper ions in this electrolyte would thus provide the conditions necessary for an electrochemical deposition of copper dendrites. This issue is significant as it contributes to the defect density for the present or even the next few layers and ultimately influences the final yield of the wafer. Therefore, it is crucial to control and prevent the occurrence of copper dendrite growth in the CMP process. The damascene process is a method used in the formation of copper interconnects, primarily due to the challenges associated with copper dry etching. This process is categorized into two types, single and double damascene. In the single damascene process, trenches and via contacts, also known as vias, are formed in separate steps. This means that the process involves individual steps for the formation of trenches and vias. While this method allows for precise control over each step, it can be time-consuming and may lead to a higher risk of defects due to the multiple etching and deposition steps. Furthermore, in the single damascene process, the barrier metal is deposited twice in the via, once for the via and once for the trench. This double deposition increases the resistance in the via, which can negatively impact the performance of the device. On the other hand, the double damascene process allows for the simultaneous formation of trenches and vias. This process is more favorable for manufacturing due to its fewer steps, which can lead to reduced costs, improved throughput, and potentially fewer defects. The double damascene process also avoids the issue of increased via racista. In the realm of back end of line, VEOL, interconnects, the choice between via first dual damascene, VFDD, and trench first dual damascene, TFDD, processes can significantly impact the performance and cost of the resulting device. VFDD, as the name suggests, involves the formation of the via before the trench. This process can lead to a reduction in lateral isolation distance when misalignment occurs, creating a potential weak point for time-dependent dielectric breakdown, TDDB. However, VFDD has the advantage of not requiring a TIN mask, making it possible to pattern using masks like SO and NFC, which can lead to lower-cost processes. 
As a result, VFDD is often used in multi-layering for wider metal pitches, typically seen in 8x and beyond nodes. On the other hand, TFDD involves the formation of the trench before the via. This process ensures that even if the via ADICD increases or misalignment occurs, the lateral isolation distance between metals does not decrease due to the formation of a self-aligned via SAV, resulting in better TDDB performance. Therefore, TFDD is often used in multi-layering for narrower metal pitches, typically seen in 1x to 4x nodes since 32 nanometers generation. A typical case where SAV is needed is when adjacent wiring is connected in a chamfer shape. In the realm of back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, the choice between VIA first dual damascene, VFDD, and trench first dual damascene, TFDD, processes can significantly influence the integrity of low-K dielectric materials. These materials, characterized by their low dielectric constant, K, are essential in reducing capacitive delay in integrated circuits. However, they are susceptible to damage during plasma processes, such as ashing, which can increase their K-value and compromise their performance. In the VFDD process, the via is etched first, followed by the trench. This sequence can potentially expose the low-K material to plasma damage twice, once during the via etch and again during the trench etch. This double exposure can lead to an increase in the K-value of the low-K material, which is undesirable as it can increase capacitive delay. On the other hand, the TFDD process, where the trench is etched first, followed by the via, can potentially reduce the exposure of the low-K material to plasma damage. However, this process is not without its challenges. Misalignment during the TFDD process can lead to a reduction in the size of the via, which can increase via resistance, affecting the overall performance of the interconnect. In terms of mitigating plasma damage, particularly from ashing, the choice of chemistry can play a significant role. Traditionally, O2-based chemistries have been used for ashing, but these can cause significant damage to low-K materials, increasing their K-value. To mitigate this, CO2 or H2-based chemistries can be used, which can reduce the damage to low-K materials. Furthermore, the impact of plasma damage on low-K materials can be exacerbated by the presence of porogen, a material used to create pores in the low-K material. Porogen can increase the K-value of the low-K material under plasma irradiation, further compromising its performance. To enhance plasma resistance for porous low-K dielectrics, a remote plasma hydrogen, H2-helium, He, plasma treatment can be used. This treatment can form a densification layer on the low-K dielectric surface without damaging the film's properties, effectively resisting plasma damage. In conclusion, both VFDD and TFDD processes have their advantages and challenges when it comes to minimizing damage to low-K materials. The choice between these processes, as well as the choice of ashing chemistry and the use of treatments like remote plasma H2-helium treatment, can significantly influence the performance of low-K materials in Buell interconnects. The trench first dual damascene, TFDD, process in back end of line, BEOL, interconnects is a complex yet crucial part of semiconductor manufacturing. It involves a series of steps that are designed to create the intricate wiring schemes within a device. The process begins with the deposition of an etch stop layer, ESL, made of SIN or SICN. This layer serves dual purposes, it improves copper electromigration and prevents oxidation. Following this, a low-K dielectric material, SICOH, is deposited. This is then followed by the deposition of a memory layer of SiO2, which serves to reduce low-K damage and assists in pattern transfer. The next step involves the deposition of ATIN mask, after which a layer of bottom anti-reflective coating, BARC, and photoresist are applied. The metal layer is then exposed to light in a process known as photoexposure. This is followed by the etching of the metal layer, creating a pattern. The via layer is then exposed to light, and subsequently etched. The memory layer is etched next, followed by the punching of the ESL. The structure then undergoes a DEGA process, followed by active preclean, a PC, to remove the oxidation layers in via bottom. Physical vapor deposition, PVD, is then used to deposit a thin barrier layer of tantalum, TA, and tantalum nitride, TA N, materials. TA is used to form the liner and TAN is for the barrier. The barrier layer is then coated over by a copper seed barrier. 
Finally, the structure is electroplated with copper and ground flat using a process known as chemical mechanical polishing, CMP. This process cycle is meticulously designed to ensure the creation of efficient and reliable interconnects within a device. Each step is carefully controlled to minimize damage to the low K materials and to ensure the integrity of the interconnects. In the semiconductor manufacturing process, the creation of multilayered copper interconnects is a complex and intricate procedure. Applied Materials, a leading equipment provider, offers a comprehensive solution for this process with their cluster tool. This tool is designed to perform a series of different processes in a continuous manner, making it an efficient equipment configuration for semiconductor manufacturing. The process begins with the preparation of the wafer for dual damascene metal interconnects. After the metal trench and via hole etch are completed, the wafer is placed in the vacuum load lock. The wafer is then moved to the Daga chamber to remove residual fumes from the preceding dry etch process and wet cleaning. This is done by leaving the wafer at a high vacuum and approximately 275 degrees Celsius for a certain period to ensure complete removal of adsorbed fumes. Next, the wafer is moved to the APC chamber, where a H2 slash helium, 5% concentration, remote plasma is applied. This step is crucial for removing residual etch polymer and copper oxide from the underlying copper, which prevents contact resistance failure. Following the APC chamber, the wafer is moved to the PVD tantalum nitride chamber. Here, tantalum nitride barrier metal is deposited first using a reactive sputtering method with a tantalum target and N2 gas. The tantalum nitride material acts as a barrier to prevent copper interconnect metal from diffusing into the low-K material, thereby maintaining yield and TDDB reliability. After the tantalum nitride barrier metal deposition, tantalum wetting material is deposited in the same chamber without N2 gas supply using a sputtering method. The tantalum material promotes even deposition of the subsequent copper material even at thin thicknesses. The final step in the process is the movement of the wafer to the PVD copper chamber for copper seed deposition. The copper material serves as a seed and electrode in the subsequent copper electroplating process. If necessary, an electromigration booster material, such as manganese, can be added using a mangan dope copper target. Once all these processes are complete, the wafer returns to the load lock and waits until all wafers have undergone the process. In summary, the DEGA, APC, tantalum nitride barrier, tantalum wetting, and copper seed processes all take place within a single cluster tool. This detailed process demonstrates the complexity and precision required in the creation of multilayered copper interconnects. Applied Materials Cluster Tool provides an efficient and comprehensive solution for this process, highlighting the company's role as a leader in semiconductor manufacturing equipment. In the realm of back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, the use of tantalum nitride, TAN, and tantalum, TA, as a liner for copper, CU, interconnects is a well established practice. This choice is primarily driven by the need to prevent the diffusion of copper into the surrounding dielectrics, which can lead to short circuits and chip failures. The liner, therefore, serves as a barrier layer, isolating copper from the surrounding intralayer and interlayer dielectrics. Tantalum nitride slash tantalum liners are chosen for their unique properties that make them suitable for this role. Firstly, they exhibit excellent adhesion to both copper and the dielectric materials, which is crucial for the stability of the interconnect structure. Secondly, they possess a sufficiently low resistivity, which is important to ensure that the overall resistance of the interconnect line is not significantly increased. Moreover, tantalum nitride slash tantalum liners are compatible with the chemical mechanical polishing, CMP, process, a critical step in the fabrication of copper interconnects. This compatibility is important as it ensures that the liner material can withstand the CMP process without being excessively worn away or causing damage to the copper interconnects. In addition, tantalum nitride slash tantalum liners are compatible with low-K materials. Low-K materials are used as dielectrics and interconnect structures due to their low dielectric constant, which helps to reduce the capacitive delay in the interconnects. However, these materials are often sensitive to moisture and can be damaged by exposure to certain chemicals. The use of a tantalum nitride slash tantalum liner helps to protect these sensitive materials from such damage. Furthermore, tantalum nitride slash tantalum liners have good step coverage, meaning they can conformally coat the complex topographies of the interconnect structures. 
This is important as it ensures that the liner can effectively isolate the copper from the dielectrics, even in areas where the interconnect structure is highly irregular. In the realm of back end of line, BEOL, interconnect technology, a critical aspect of semiconductor device fabrication, the performance of the barrier metal is paramount. This performance is typically evaluated using a widely accepted method known as current voltage measurement after barrier thermal stress, CVBTS. Copper, CU, with its superior electrical conductivity, is the preferred material for interconnects and semiconductor devices. However, copper has a propensity to diffuse into the surrounding dielectric material, potentially leading to device failure. To counteract this, a barrier layer is employed. The effectiveness of this barrier layer is a vital determinant of the reliability and performance of the device. The barrier layer's performance is commonly assessed using a metal insulator semiconductor, MIS, structure, which simulates the actual device conditions. In this structure, the barrier layer is sandwiched between the copper layer and the insulator layer. The barrier layer's effectiveness is gauged by measuring the leakage current through the insulator layer, a lower leakage current indicates superior barrier performance. In this MIS structure, if the barrier properties are poor, copper diffusion can lead to the formation of deep donor levels in the semiconductor, causing a shift in the CV curve. This phenomenon further emphasizes the importance of maintaining high-quality barrier properties to prevent such detrimental effects on the device performance. Tantalum, TA, and tantalum nitride, TA N, are frequently used as barrier materials. Among these, tantalum nitride has been found to exhibit superior barrier performance due to its higher heat of formation with copper, which makes it more challenging for copper to diffuse through the barrier layer. Moreover, the barrier layer's performance can be significantly influenced by the process conditions. For instance, after annealing, a heat treatment process, the barrier performance of tantalum significantly deteriorates, while tantalum nitride maintains its performance. This highlights the importance of not only selecting the right barrier material but also optimizing the process conditions to enhance the performance and reliability of semiconductor devices. In addition, to achieve optimal barrier properties, the composition of tantalum and nitrogen and tantalum nitride should be carefully controlled during reactive sputtering to ensure the formation of an amorphous structure. This amorphous structure has been found to enhance the barrier properties, further contributing to the overall performance of the device. The purpose of a liner in copper interconnects is to prevent the diffusion of copper into the dielectrics and to serve as an adhesive layer between copper and the dielectrics. The liner material can significantly influence the properties of a thin copper layer. Titanium nitride and tantalum nitride are commonly used as diffusion barriers, but they can deteriorate copper adhesion. To improve adhesion, a thin elementary film of the metal used in the diffusion barrier is often applied. This enables metallic adhesion and inter-diffusion of the copper layer. In the case of tantalum, it can additionally allow the formation of intermetallic compounds at the tantalum slash copper interface which may further increase adhesion. Ruthenium, RU, has drawn much attention lately as an adhesion layer and possible diffusion barrier for copper interconnects in VLSI circuits. While the diffusion barrier properties of sputtered ruthenium layers are less attractive, wetting and adhesion experiments have shown promising results. In conclusion, the choice of liner material can significantly influence the microstructure and resistivity of the copper films. A clear dependence of the copper resistivity on the microstrain was demonstrated, which further allowed to estimate the dislocation density in the copper films. In the pursuit of ensuring the reliability of back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, a key objective is to guarantee a lifetime expectation of 10 years at an operating temperature of 85 degrees Celsius for conventional applications. However, it is impractical to conduct real-time testing over such an extended period. Therefore, accelerated testing methods are employed to predict the lifetime of these interconnects. The process of electromigration, where the momentum of moving electrons causes atomic movement, is a significant concern in Buell interconnects. This phenomenon can lead to the formation of voids and hillocks in the interconnect material, which can ultimately cause failures. To predict the lifetime of interconnects under the influence of electromigration, we use models that consider temperature and current as acceleration factors. The popular and familiar Arrhenius model is used when temperature is the sole acceleration factor. This model, based on the principle that reaction rates increase with temperature, is commonly used in the study of chemical reactions. 
However, in the case of electromigration, both temperature and current are significant acceleration factors. Therefore, we use Black's equation, which incorporates both these factors. Black's equation is an empirical model developed by James R. Black in the 1960s. It predicts the mean time to failure, MTTF, due to electromigration as inversely proportional to the product of the current density and an exponential function of the absolute temperature. The equation is expressed as MTTF equals A slash J to the power of N, XBA slash KT, where A is a constant, J is the current density, N is the current exponent, EA is the activation energy, K is Boltzmann's constant, and T is the absolute temperature. The activation energy, EA, in Black's equation is a critical parameter. It represents the energy barrier that must be overcome for electromigration to occur. The value of EA can vary depending on the material of the interconnect. For instance, aluminum, AL, and copper, Cu, two commonly used interconnect materials, have different EA values. Generally, copper has a higher EA than aluminum, making it more resistant to electromigration at the same operating conditions. In summary, the prediction of electromigration lifetime in Buell interconnects is a complex process that requires the consideration of multiple factors. Black's equation, with its incorporation of both temperature and current as acceleration factors, provides a robust model for this prediction. The specific material properties, such as the activation energy, also play a crucial role in determining the electromigration resistance of the interconnects. Electromigration is a significant reliability concern for copper interconnects, especially as aggressive physical dimension and current density scaling continues. During electromigration, copper atoms migrate along the electron flow direction, leaving a void at the cathode end of the line, which can cause an open circuit failure. This phenomenon differs significantly from that in aluminum interconnects, where a stable aluminum oxide layer passivates the top interface and grain boundaries are the fastest pathways. In the case of copper interconnects, mass transport along the copper-slash-silicon nitride interface is faster than at grain boundaries due to the defects on that interface created by the CMP process before cap layer deposition. This is particularly relevant in the context of the dual damascene structure, where the direction of electron flow, whether top to down or down to top, can influence the location of void formation. Comparing the activation energy required for copper diffusion along various pathways, it becomes evident that the copper-slash-silicon nitride interface requires the least energy, making it the most likely site for electromigration failure. This is in contrast to aluminum metal, where failure primarily occurs at the grain boundary. The CUSIN interface has an activation energy of 0.7 electron volts, which is significantly lower than that of the copper grain boundary, 1.2 electron volts, copper lattice, 2.1 electron volts, and copper slash tantalum interface, 0.9 tilde 1.2 electron volts. In conclusion, the electromigration failure mode in CHU interconnects is a complex phenomenon influenced by various factors, including the CHU diffusion pathways, the grain size, and the cap layer effects. Understanding these factors is crucial for improving the reliability and performance of CHU interconnects. In the realm of semiconductor interconnects, the use of manganese dope copper seed layers has emerged as a promising approach to enhance electromigration EM, performance, particularly in the context of copper interconnects. This strategy leverages the unique properties of manganese to form a protective manganese oxide passivation layer at the copper-slash-top silicon nitride interface, which significantly improves interface migration and, consequently, electromigration resistance. The underlying mechanism involves the migration of manganese MN atoms to the copper-slash-top SIN interface upon exposure to heat. This migration process results in the formation of a manganese oxide passivation layer that serves to enhance the electromigration performance of the copper interconnects. A study conducted by Bain et al. 2017, investigated the enhanced electromigration performance of 20 nanometers wide copper interconnects with a manganese doped copper seed and a manganese base barrier. The study employed low frequency noise measurements and atom probe tomography, APT, to analyze the interconnects. The results revealed that while the EM activation energy of reference interconnects without manganese was 0.8 electron volts, the copper manganese interconnects exhibited an activation energy of 1.0 to 1.1 electron volts, indicating improved electromigration resistance. 
Interestingly, the study also found that manganese was present at the top surface and small clusters of manganese were present in the copper bulk up to 5 nanometers away from the sidewalls. However, manganese segregation at the grain boundaries was not observed, suggesting that the hypothesis of manganese blocking grain boundary diffusion could not be confirmed. These findings underscore the potential of manganese doped copper seed layers as a viable strategy for improving the electromigration performance of copper interconnects. By forming a protective manganese oxide passivation layer at the copper slash top silicon nitride interface, this approach offers a promising avenue for enhancing the reliability and longevity of semiconductor interconnects. The use of cobalt, CO, in the fabrication of copper, Cu, interconnects has been introduced as a method to enhance electromigration resistance in 22 nanometers ground rule dual damascene copper interconnects. In this process, the traditional PVD tantalum nitride barrier slash tantalum liner layers and copper manganese alloy seed layers are replaced with a PVD tantalum nitride barrier slash CVD cobalt liner scheme with selective CVD cobalt capping. The study found that the top surface segregation of the manganese dopant and alloy seed layers is suppressed in the presence of the CVD cobalt liner. The use of selective CVD cobalt layers as an alternate metal capping was also evaluated in combination with CVD cobalt liners. The results showed good electrical yields in line with the cobalt liner slash cobalt cap scheme. The PVD tantalum nitride slash cobalt liner slash selective CVD cobalt cap combination was found to have greatly enhanced electromigration performance over PVD tantalum nitride slash tantalum liner slash PVD copper manganese controls with T50 fail times for the former being 100 times longer than the controls. Kinetic studies of the CVD cobalt liner slash selective cobalt cap samples showed electromigration activation energies of 1.7 electron volts, a substantial enhancement over the 1.0 electron volts obtained for the PVD TIA and TACU MN controls. In the context of Buell interconnects, this approach provides a significant improvement in electromigration resistance, which is a critical factor in the reliability and performance of semiconductor devices. The use of cobalt as a liner and capping layer in the fabrication process not only improves the electromigration resistance but also reduces the formation of copper voids, which can negatively impact the electrical performance of the interconnects. The use of cobalt in this context is part of a broader trend in the semiconductor industry towards the exploration of new materials and process techniques to improve the performance and reliability of devices as feature sizes continue to scale down. This is particularly important in the context of Buell interconnects, which are a critical component of integrated circuits and have a significant impact on the overall performance and reliability of these devices. The applied Endura Volta CVD cobalt system is a significant technological advancement in chemical vapor deposition, CVD, marking the first material change in over 15 years of copper barrier slash C, CUBS, development. This system enables the continuation of high-performance interconnect scaling. The technology allows for the deposition of liner and selective cap layers less than 20A ring thick that enhance interconnect yield and reliability at the 2x nanometer node and beyond. The Volta CVD cobalt system is the industry's only vacuum-based electromigration, EM, mitigation solution and the only CVD cobalt liner product integrated on the same platform with pre-clean, barrier, and copper seed processes. The system introduces a new era of materials for extending copper interconnect technology. It promotes copper seed layer coverage by improving copper wetting, resulting in a thin, continuous, conformal layer that facilitates the repair of discontinuities and the formation of a robust seed layer. This high-quality layer, in turn, promotes void-free copper gap fill at the most advanced nodes. The shrinking geometries in modern processors result in higher resistance and greater susceptibility to EM failures in the copper lines. A high-quality bond at the interface between the copper and the dielectric barrier layer is vital for avoiding EM failures. The Volta system's best-in-class, greater than 100 to 1, selective metal capping process strengthens adhesion at the copper dielectric interface to improve EM performance by an order of magnitude without increasing line resistance or degrading time-dependent dielectric breakdown TDDB. The combined use of Volta CVD cobalt as both liner and selective metal cap enables complete encapsulation of copper lines and ensures the most robust interconnect reliability for the 2x nanometer node and beyond. The CVD cobalt seed enhancing liner promotes the formation of a robust seed layer, extending void-free copper gap fill beyond 20 nanometers. 
The CVD selective metal capping strengthens copper to dielectric adhesion, improving reliability without increasing line resistance or degrading time-dependent dielectric breakdown TDDB. In conclusion, the applied Endura Volta CVD Cobalt system provides a unique solution to the challenges of interconnect scaling, offering a new approach to material deposition and electromigration mitigation. This system represents a significant step forward in the field of interconnect technology, enabling the continuation of Moore's law scaling and the development of increasingly complex and powerful electronic devices. Applied Materials, as a globally recognized leader in semiconductor manufacturing, has championed the development of the innovative single wafer cluster tool. The single wafer cluster tool is essentially a modular system that conducts an array of deposition processes on individual silicon wafers. An essential feature of the single wafer cluster tool is its capacity to seamlessly integrate numerous processing steps. This integration markedly reduces wafer handling and the accompanying risks, while improving process control, uniformity, and repeatability. The tool also manages to boost throughput by operating multiple process modules simultaneously, thereby expediting the thin film deposition process. As we delve into the following video, we'll have the opportunity to scrutinize the unique wafer routing process and applied materials cluster tool. Applied's integrated copper barrier seed solution on the proven Endura platform is the gold standard for interconnect metallization in logic and memory fabs today. We integrate multiple surface preparations, film deposition, and metrology technologies on a single platform under vacuum. The process of filling copper interconnects begins with multi-chamber surface engineering. This preparation differentiates the materials and is key to achieving selective deposition. The surface preparation is followed by an atomic layer deposition, or ALD process, of a tantalum-based material that coats only the desired surfaces. Integrated onboard metrology is used to measure the accuracy of the deposited thin films without breaking vacuum. ALD deposition is followed by a densification process that improves the film's barrier properties. A thin CVD cobalt liner encapsulates the copper wires, extending circuit life and enabling copper reflow. Finally, highly directional PVD deposits a thin layer of continuous copper. Our unique system enables cold deposition and high temperature processing in the same chamber. In summary, we integrate seven consecutive steps in one system under pristine vacuum conditions to achieve void-free interconnects that deliver world-class electrical performance. In the realm of Biol, back end of line, interconnects, the PVD, physical vapor deposition, copper seed reflow process has emerged as a promising technique to enhance the electromigration, EM, resistance of copper wiring. This method is particularly effective when used in conjunction with a ruthenium liner, which has several advantageous properties such as high surface energy, low interface energy with copper, low resistivity, and no intermixing with copper during the process. The reflow process is essentially a bottom-up process, with the copper able to reflow well on the ruthenium liner. The high surface energy of ruthenium, 3000 erg slash square centimeter, promotes the reflow of copper, leading to a smooth, continuous copper film. This is crucial for the subsequent steps in the interconnect fabrication process. One of the key process optimizations in this method is the control of pattern dependency and copper reflow. This is achieved through careful process parameter control, ensuring uniform copper seed layer deposition and reflow across the wafer. In terms of reliability, the PVD copper seed reflow process has been proven to pass EM and TDDB, time-dependent dielectric breakdown, tests. The application of cobalt capping further enhances the EM performance by boosting the activation energy, EA. Moreover, the use of robust ULK, ultra-low K, dielectrics with higher hydrophobicity contributes to TDDB reliability. However, there are some concerns associated with this process. The CMP, chemical mechanical polishing, removal rate of the ruthenium film is relatively slow, necessitating the use of a strong oxidizer for CMP. This can lead to issues such as poor within wafer and within chip uniformity, IWU, ICU, and galvanic corrosion of copper. 
In summary, the PVD copper seed reflow process, when used with a ruthenium liner, offers a promising approach to enhance the electromigration resistance of copper interconnects and buell processes. Despite some challenges, with careful process control and optimization, it can contribute significantly to the performance and reliability of semiconductor devices. Stress migration, SM, or stress-induced void, SIV, is a phenomenon that occurs in the back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, specifically in copper, CU, wiring. It is a result of the mechanical stress that builds up in the metal lines due to the thermal expansion mismatch between the metal and the dielectric material. This stress can cause vacancies in the metal, which can then migrate and coalesce to form voids, leading to an open circuit or increased resistance, thereby affecting the reliability of the device. The occurrence of SM is highly dependent on temperature. As the temperature increases, the stress decreases, but the diffusion of vacancies increases. This balance between stress and diffusion results in the highest occurrence of SM in the temperature range of 175 to 225 degrees Celsius. This phenomenon is well explained by the McPherson model, which provides a comprehensive understanding of the kinetics of stress migration and the formation of stress-induced voids. In the case of copper wiring, the voids typically form along the grain boundaries and the interface between the copper and the dielectric material. The void formation can be influenced by several factors, including the grain structure of the copper, the properties of the dielectric material, and the thermal and mechanical properties of the copper-slash-dielectric interface. One of the strategies to mitigate the effects of SM is the use of liners and barriers that can suppress the diffusion of copper atoms and thus reduce the formation of voids. However, the effectiveness of these mitigation strategies can be influenced by the properties of the liners and barriers, such as their adhesion to copper and the dielectric, their diffusion barrier performance, and their mechanical properties. In conclusion, stress migration is a critical reliability concern in Buell interconnects, and understanding its mechanisms and influencing factors is crucial for the design and fabrication of reliable electronic devices. The dual damascene process in back end of line, BEOL, interconnects often involves the use of a titanium nitride, TIN, hard mask. This hard mask is crucial for defining the pattern of the copper interconnects. However, one of the challenges that arise during this process is the residual stress in the TIN hard mask. This stress can cause undulations, or wiggling, in the dielectric ridge, which can lead to issues in the interconnect structure. The source of this wiggling is the compressive residual stress in the TIN films. This stress, coupled with the weak elastic properties of the dielectric material, can cause deformation in the trench structure. In severe cases, this can even lead to the collapse of the trench structure. Furthermore, as the feature sizes shrink, copper voids can occur, exacerbating the problem. To address this issue, one approach is to reduce the compressive residual stress in the TIN film. This can be achieved by adjusting the DC power stress during the deposition of the TIN film. By reducing the DC power stress, the compressive stress in the TIN film can be decreased, thereby mitigating the wiggling phenomenon. However, this approach is not without its challenges. The chemical mechanical polishing, CMP, removal rate of the TIN film is relatively slow. This necessitates the use of a strong oxidizer for CMP, which can lead to issues such as poor in wafer uniformity, IWU, and in chip uniformity, ICU, as well as galvanic corrosion of the copper. In conclusion, managing the residual stress in the TIN hard mask is a critical aspect of the dual damascene process in Buell interconnects. By carefully controlling the DC power stress during TIN deposition, it is possible to mitigate the wiggling phenomenon and improve the reliability of the interconnect structure. In the realm of semiconductor manufacturing, the back end of line, BEOL, process involves creating metal interconnecting, wiring, lines on the semiconductor device. Copper, CU has been the material of choice for these interconnects due to its low resistivity and high reliability. However, as technology continues to scale down, the resistivity of these copper interconnects increases, which is a phenomenon known as the resistivity size effect. The resistivity size effect in copper interconnects is primarily attributed to three scattering mechanisms, surface scattering, grain boundary scattering, and surface roughness scattering. Surface scattering occurs when the dimensions of the interconnect become comparable to the electron-mean free path which is about 39 nanometers for copper. 
When the interconnect width is reduced, the probability of electrons scattering off the interconnect surfaces increases, leading to an increase in resistivity. Grain boundary scattering is another significant factor. As the line width of the copper interconnect decreases, the number of grain boundaries that an electron encounters during its movement increases. This increased scattering at grain boundaries contributes to the overall increase in resistivity. Surface roughness scattering is also a key contributor to the resistivity size effect. As the interconnect line width decreases, the surface roughness becomes more pronounced relative to the size of the interconnect. This increased surface roughness leads to more scattering events, thereby increasing the resistivity. These scattering mechanisms are further exacerbated by the fact that the electron mean free path in copper is larger than the dimensions of the interconnects in advanced technology nodes. This means that a significant portion of the electron population is undergoing boundary scattering, which increases resistivity. In addition to these, other factors such as electromigration and temperature also play a role in the resistivity size effect. Electromigration refers to the movement of metal atoms due to the momentum transfer from the electron wind which can lead to voids and hillocks in the interconnect, increasing its resistivity. Temperature changes can also affect resistivity, as higher temperatures lead to increased phonon scattering. In conclusion, the resistivity size effect in copper interconnects is a complex phenomenon that arises due to a combination of various scattering mechanisms and other factors. As technology continues to scale down, understanding and mitigating this effect is crucial for maintaining the performance and reliability of semiconductor devices. As the line width of copper interconnects narrows, two major problems arise. The first is the reliability degradation due to electromigration and stress voiding as current density and device operating temperature increase. This necessitates the need for an alternative material that has a high melting point and low resistivity, such as refractory metals. The second issue is the resistivity size effect due to the electron mean free path of copper material being 39 nanometers. In the case of a line width of 10 nanometers, the resistivity increases to more than 10 times the bulk resistivity, causing serious problems with power consumption and RC delay. As a result, alternative metals are being introduced in areas with narrow local interconnects. The requirements for an alternative metal are that it has a long electron mean free path, low bulk resistivity, and that the cost increase compared to copper is not significantly burdensome. Materials such as cobalt, ruthenium, molybdenum, and nickel have been selected as alternative metals and are already being used partially for local interconnect wiring. The electron mean free path is the average distance that an electron can travel without scattering, which is a form of collision that causes the electron to change direction. When the electron mean free path is long, the resistivity decreases because the electrons can move more freely and efficiently, leading to less energy loss and thus lower resistivity. In particular, ruthenium and molybdenum materials, despite their high bulk resistivity, show a lower resistivity inversion shape in narrow wiring than copper and tungsten materials. They also show superior reliability results compared to copper, and the possibility of reducing the barrier thickness or a barrier-less process is attracting attention due to these materials. In summary, as the line width of copper interconnects narrows, the problems of reliability degradation and resistivity size effect become prominent. To overcome these issues, alternative metals with specific properties such as a long electron mean free path and low bulk resistivity are being introduced. Among these, cobalt, ruthenium, molybdenum, and nickel are already being partially used for local interconnect wiring, with ruthenium and molybdenum materials showing promising results despite their high bulk resistivity. In recent years, the development of copper, CU, wiring in Buell, back end of line, interconnects has been a significant area of focus in the semiconductor industry. The miniaturization of semiconductor devices has necessitated the use of copper due to its superior electrical conductivity compared to traditional materials like aluminum. However, the continued scaling down of devices has led to increased resistivity in copper interconnects, a phenomenon known as the size effect. This has prompted researchers to explore new strategies to mitigate this issue. One of the most promising approaches is the use of barrier layers. These layers, typically composed of tantalum, TA, or tantalum nitride, TAN, are used to prevent copper diffusion, which can lead to device failure. However, as devices continue to shrink, these barrier layers occupy a larger proportion of the interconnect volume, thereby increasing resistivity. To address this, recent research has focused on developing thinner, yet effective barrier layers. For instance, self-forming barrier, SFB, layers have been proposed, which form in situ during copper electroplating, resulting in thinner and more uniform layers compared to conventional methods. Another significant trend in copper interconnect development is the exploration of alternative metals. As shown in figure 12 of the provided document, 
there has been a surge in research into metals such as cobalt, CO, ruthenium, RU, and molybdenum, MO, as potential replacements for copper. These metals exhibit lower resistivity at nanoscale dimensions and are less prone to electromigration, a common failure mechanism in copper interconnects. Among these, Cobalt has received the most attention due to its superior electromigration resistance and compatibility with existing manufacturing processes. In addition to alternative metals, there is also a growing interest in the use of interconnect architectures that can mitigate the resistivity increase in scaled devices. One such architecture is the air gap structure, where portions of the dielectric layer are replaced with air, significantly reducing the overall capacitance and hence, the RC delay. In conclusion, the development of copper wiring in Buell interconnects is undergoing significant changes to address the challenges posed by device scaling. The focus is on developing thinner barrier layers, exploring alternative metals, and innovative interconnect architectures. These advancements are expected to play a crucial role in the continued miniaturization of semiconductor devices. In the field of back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, the evolution of copper, CU, Wiring has been a significant focus, particularly with the use of thin barrier metals to mitigate resistivity size effects and improve via resistance. As the dimensions of integrated circuits continue to shrink, the interconnects quality becomes a critical factor in determining their performance and reliability. Traditionally, physical vapor deposition, PVD, tantalum slash tantalum nitride B layers have been used as barrier layers in the 130 nanometers technology node. However, as the feature sizes continue to shrink, depositing a continuous and thin PVD copper seed layer into high aspect ratio features becomes increasingly challenging due to the inherently poor step coverage of the sputter technique. To address this, the industry has shifted towards atomic layer deposition, ALD, of tantalum nitride slash tantalum liner, which allows for a more conformal deposition, thus enabling the creation of thinner barrier layers. This shift has led to a significant reduction in via resistance and resistivity size effects, improving the overall performance of the copper interconnects. More recently, the industry has started exploring the use of cobalt slash ruthenium liner as a barrier layer. These materials offer even lower resistivity than tantalum nitride slash tantalum, allowing for further improvements in via resistance and resistivity size effects. However, as we continue to push the limits of thin barrier metal technology, we are approaching a point where even the thinnest barrier metals will not suffice. This is where concepts like selective barrier schemes, barrier-less approaches, and subtractive etch schemes come into play. These technologies aim to extend the life of copper interconnects by eliminating the need for a barrier metal altogether or by selectively depositing the barrier only where it's needed. In the realm of back end of line, BEOL, interconnects, the development of copper, CU, wiring has been a focal point of recent research and technological advancements. A significant challenge in this field is the reduction of via resistance, particularly as we move towards the 3 nanometers technology node and beyond. A novel integration approach, known as the Selective Barrier Scheme or Reverse Selective Barrier Metal, RSBM, has been introduced to address this issue. This scheme utilizes a gas phase metal passivation method to achieve a barrier-free via bottom, thereby reducing via resistance by over 50% without compromising reliability. The selective barrier scheme operates by providing highly selective tantalum nitride, TAN, growth on dielectric as compared to that on metal. This results in a thinner TAN barrier on the via bottom, which is instrumental in reducing resistance. The scheme employs self-assembled monolayers, SAM, which are highly selective and self-limited. They are absorbed on metal but not on any other surrounding dielectric. With the SAM attached on the metal surface, it hinders the atomic layer deposition, ALD, tantalum nitride precursor adsorption on the surface, causing a strong nucleation delay of ALDTA and growth. The SAM material like dodecanthiol, DDT, is removed through H2 ashing after ALDTA and deposition. Following this, a plasma treatment is conducted, and then the process proceeds with the CVD cobalt liner and copper seed reflow operations. Reliability tests, including time-dependent dielectric breakdown, TDDB, and copper electromigration, EM, have shown that the selective barrier scheme is equivalent to the current plan of record, POR, approach, indicating no dielectric damage and copper EM performance degradation. This innovative approach to copper wiring development in Buell Interconnects represents a significant stride forward in the field. The document titled Hybrid Metallization with Copper in Sub-30 Nanometers Interconnects by Marlene H. van der Veen discusses the development and application of a barrier-less scheme using ruthenium prefill via and copper interconnects. The paper presents a hybrid metallization scheme where different metals are combined for the vias and trenches. 
The vias are first filled with a barrier less ruthenium using a pre-fill methodology, after which the remainder of the vias and the lines are filled using a conventional barrier slash liner copper metallization scheme. This approach improves the process window and yield for the subsequent copper gap fill. The paper demonstrates that the ruthenium prefill significantly improves the VIA yield for the copper metallization in 21 nanometers metal pitch. The ruthenium copper hybrid system shows good yields and narrow distributions in 21 metal pitch dual damascene VIA structures. The VIA resistance benchmark with cobalt and ruthenium metallization scheme shows that the barrier less ruthenium metallization gives the lowest resistance. This experimental data confirms the trends as expected from VIA resistance modeling. The ruthenium prefill was done with the CVD of carbonyl alkyl cyclohexadiene ruthenium H2 at 150 or 250 degrees Celsius using H2 or NH3 co reactant after a 300 surface passivation with dimethyl amino trimethyl silane, DMS TMS, vapor phase treatment at 250 degrees Celsius. The metallization continues with a 2 nm PVD TAN 1.3 nm CVD ruthenium PVD copper seed and acidic plating for the overburden which is removed by CMP. The ruthenium copper hybrid system extends the copper metallization for 21 metal pitch. The resistance data shows that the conventional copper metallization on the tantalum nitride barrier slash ruthenium liner does not give any viable vias at 21 metal pitch. Proceeding this metallization with the ruthenium prefill results in active vias and increases the yield with a resistance centered around 50 ohms. The paper concludes that the barrier less ruthenium approach is the most extendable metallization scheme for advanced nodes. The ruthenium copper hybrid sample shows a slightly improved performance compared to the copper reference sample in terms of electromigration performance, making it a viable scaling scenario for dual damascene metallizations in 5 nanometers node technologies and beyond. The ruthenium semi damascene scheme is a promising alternative to the traditional copper dual damascene integration, especially as interconnect devices scale to smaller metal pitches. The traditional copper dual damascene integration faces challenges in meeting device requirements when scaling Buell towards the 2 nm node with 16 nm metal pitch. This is due to the reduced volume for copper caused by the requirement for a metal barrier, leading to an exponential increase in wire resistance and a negative impact on RC delay. Ruthenium, RU, a noble metal, emerges as a promising material for this application. It has a low bulk resistivity and high melting point, and can be integrated without a diffusion barrier on the via bottom or a metal liner as long as adhesion to interfaces is ensured. Furthermore, its suitability for subtractive etching gives access to higher aspect ratios, enabling the opportunity to reduce line resistance without the need for filling high aspect ratio trenches or for metal CMP. In the ruthenium semi-damascene scheme, the via is first etched into the dielectric. This is followed by a single metal deposition step where the via and trench are formed simultaneously. The metal line is then formed by subtractive etching. This process flow is beneficial in reducing the film resistivity, and the etch chemistry selectivity to SiO2 reduces the risk of significant overetch into the via dielectric. The ruthenium semi-damascene scheme also incorporates air gap technology, which is effective in reducing RC at small nodes. Devices fabricated using this scheme have demonstrated promising electrical yield and extrapolated lifetime of more than 10 years. The mechanical strength of these devices is comparable to traditional copper dual damascene. In terms of process flow, the lower metal layer is formed by single damascene with ruthenium fill and CMP, which will be used as a routing and contacting layer. The dielectric stack is then deposited and vias are patterned using EUV lithography. Vias are then etched to land on the ruthenium lines below with a CD of 20 nanometers. A dual ruthenium layer is then deposited, ALD ruthenium for via fill followed by PVD ruthenium to achieve 40 nanometers final line thickness. This will be the final line height. A very thin TIN adhesion layer is needed below the ruthenium. Annealing at 420 degrees Celsius and forming gas follows, which is beneficial in reducing the film resistivity. The SiO2 hard mask and etching stack is deposited followed by EUV single print lithography to form the 30 metal pitch line pattern. This is aligned to the VIA layer using topography-based overlay. Finally, the ruthenium is etched, where the etch chemistry selectivity to SiO2 reduces the risk of significant overetch into the VIA dielectric. In conclusion, the ruthenium semi-damascene scheme with air gaps is a promising option for interconnects at 2 nm node and beyond offering a viable alternative to traditional copper dual damascene integration. Your enthusiasm for delving into the foundations of Buell Interconnect Episode 2, a pivotal component of semiconductor technology, is truly commendable. As a community of lifelong learners, your curiosity and commitment are the sparks that ignite our drive. 
If you've found our content valuable, we kindly encourage you to express your support by clicking the like button, subscribing to our channel, and activating notifications to stay abreast of our latest explorations. In our forthcoming episode, we'll probe further into the broad introduction to metal film, its properties, metrology, and its diverse applications in semiconductor devices. Your sustained support and zeal are the propellants that fuel our journey. Stay connected with Semi Slides as we continue to shed light on the captivating world of semiconductor technology. We eagerly anticipate your presence in our next episode.